pellets impart momentum and outward acceleration to particles of target material. The particles are accelerated forward and sideways with such force that their inertia carries them outwards for a time after the missile has passed, and by this mechanism, the track of the missile is expanded momentarily into a temporary cavity. The M1 rifle is used to illustrate. This 30 caliber firearm was used extensively in the Second World War. Here the M1 bullet is contacting the gelatin block face. This temporary cavity, as it builds, has a greater dilatation toward the end of the path because of bullet stability loss, or yawing, and greater frontal area presented to the gelatin. Hence, a more rapid transfer of energy. Later in temporary cavity formation, massive distension occurs. All of this consumes no more than a small fraction of a second. Though it's too fast for the unaided eye to appreciate, this activity has profound implications in wound management and ordnance design. In 1898, after experimenting with 10 can targets variously filled with water, tomatoes, and sand or marbles, Charles E. Woodruff, the 19th century U.S. Army pioneer in ballistics research, diagrammed pressure changes and target deformity resulting from high-speed bullets. He suggested the hydraulic engineering term cavitation be applied to the momentary distortion of tissue. This helped explain the more massive tissue disruption caused by newer military rifles, previously referred to as the explosive effect. It was not until the 1940s that the first spark shadowgrams and motion picture views of temporary cavities were taken. Since then, a variety of techniques have been used to visualize temporary cavities. High-speed X-ray photography indicates that fragments of fractured bone participate in formation of the temporary cavity. Then they return to near their original position because of the elastic retentive forces of surrounding tissue. These studies employ the high cam motion picture camera, which transports film at the rate of 8,000 frames per second, with a shutter speed of 1 20,000ths of a second. The targets utilized are 20% ordnance gelatin in water, cast as rectangular blocks around human long bones. This substance approximates the consistency of skeletal muscle. Bones were normal as established by specimen x-ray. Segments of femurs and tibias were used. The transparent gelatin permits the bone to be seen. In this instance, the bone is a proximal tibia. The range shows the photographer and lighting system on the right and the test target on the stand to the left. A silver reflecting screen behind the gelatin block reflects light to give a clearer outline of the contained bone. The target is seen in the middle of the photograph from the firing position. Just beyond is a cardboard box sealed with white tape containing sawdust. Missiles fired through the gelatin can be recovered in an atraumatic fashion in the sawdust and then studied for deformation. A single frame of the high cam, high speed ballistics footage shows a bullet approaching the face of the block, which contains a proximal femur. After the test shot, the block was melted away under hot running water and the bone macerated in 3% sodium hydroxide. After passage through ether to remove marrow fat, bone fragments, seen on the left, were laboriously put back together with clear monofilament and epoxy glue. The fracture patterns are now clearly evident in the reconstructed bone. Three handguns and three rifles were the weapons tested. Three were black powder weapons. The other three fired modern smokeless powder. These are the projectiles in the various calibers. Black gunpowder wrapped in paper is near the 54 and 58 caliber Civil War rifle bullets. This is the fashion in which powder was issued to soldiers of the time for convenience of dumping a pre-measured charge down a barrel. 
The first weapon tested is the 44 caliber model 1860 Colt Army revolver. The test employed a 148 grain lead bullet driven by 30 grains of black powder at a speed of 615 feet per second. The revolver is readied for fire. The weapon is discharged. The missile will pass from left to right. After distortion and creation of the temporary cavity, the block pulsates, then returns to original size. Constriction, because of the elastic properties of the gelatin, results in a permanent track of considerably smaller diameter than the temporary cavity. Note the wooden plug that seals the top of the bone. This is to prevent the escape of marrow under high pressure at impact. The next weapon tested is the 45 caliber pistol, Colt's model 1911. In conformity with the 1907 Hague Convention, fully jacketed lead bullets are utilized in this weapon. The bullet is 230 grains in weight and travels at approximately 800 feet per second. The target is a proximal tibia situated upside down in the gelatin block for mounting convenience. The tubular track is passing parallel to the table towards the epiphyseal end of this bone. In 1873, Colt came out with the rear-loading cartridge revolver. The single-action army was the official sidearm of the U.S. military from 1875 to 1892. It was produced initially for black powder cartridges in 45 caliber and later for smokeless powder cartridges. The weapon shown chambers the 357 Magnum cartridge available since 1935, which is a 38 caliber bullet in a long case. The semi-jacketed hollow point bullet to be tested is designed to deform into a mushroom shape and present a large frontal area to the target material. This increases the rate of energy transfer. Such rounds may be carried by law enforcement officers since they are not subject to the 1907 Hague Convention. A proximal tibia is embedded upside down in gelatin. The maximum temporary cavity forms about two inches in advance of the bone. The impact of this fast moving hollow point bullet is so violent, it throws the block into the air. The aluminum foil covering the target stand is considerably disrupted. This is the 54 caliber Sharps carbine, a black powder rifle in which 50 grains of powder project a 475 grain solid conical lead bullet at less than 1,000 feet per second. The rifle is readied for fire and discharged. A distal femur is the test target. The missile will enter from the left. A jet of bone marrow escapes through the shaft of the bone at the top. Note the temporary cavity is considerably larger than with the handguns. After a number of oscillations, the block settles down to its original shape. Gaseous clouds ripple the table's aluminum foil and almost remove the identifying sign from its side. The second rifle tested is the 58 caliber Springfield, widely used in the American Civil War. This 1862 muzzle-loaded weapon projects a 510 grain mini ball with 60 grains of black powder at approximately 1,050 feet per second. Once again, the weapon is readied and discharged. Note the tremendous shock of this heavy bullet. It travels considerably faster because the barrel is longer compared to the sharps. A burst of fluid is ejected anterior to the femur, and then the block is lifted off the table into the air. While airborne, the temporary cavity immediately shrinks down to a permanent track. Note the considerable disruption of the gelatin behind the femur because of secondary missiles, specifically cortical fragments from the femur. 
The final weapon tested is the current issue rifle for the United States Armed Forces, the 5.56 mm M16A1. It exemplifies the trend in military armament towards smaller calibers firing bullets of higher velocity, in this case, 3,200 feet per second. Not only do these weapons create more devastating wounds, but fighting men are able to carry considerably more ammunition since the cartridges are smaller. This is a 22 caliber missile. The M16 is readied and fired. A distal femur is the test target. Note the marrow ejection from the top of the bone and the block's distortion. Again, the block is carried off the table out of the field of view. This time, the sign is totally removed from the stand by the blast. It's clear that these events happen very quickly. Even with the slow motion of high-speed motion pictures, it may be helpful to use still photographs in reviewing the action. First, the 44 caliber black powder revolver. The missile approaches the proximal tibia, creating a tubular temporary cavity approximately three inches in diameter. The missile transgresses the bone, and after the test, the block has a narrow permanent track resembling a drill hole. This gives no indication of the dilatation which instantaneously occurred. This specimen radiograph of the bone in the block shows lead fragments to the right removed from the bullet during impact with the bone. After sodium hydroxide digestion, the diameter of the permanent track through the bone coincides rather precisely with the diameter of the 44 caliber missile. A fully jacketed 45 caliber pistol bullet approaches the block containing a proximal tibia. On impact, a temporary cavity is created, which is smaller than the one from the 44 caliber black powder revolver. This is a view of the block after the test shot. The wooden plug, which seals in the marrow, is still in place. The permanent track again resembles a drill hole through the gelatin. There is not much disruption of the contained bone. In a specimen x-ray, the tubular track of the missile through the bone is evident, as are fracture lines radiating proximally and distally. There are no lead fragments removed from the missile because the soft lead was encased in a hard jacket. Except for rifling grooves, the missile recovered from the sawdust could not be distinguished from an unfired bullet. A view of the bone after reconstitution indicates five fragments. On the left is the anterior view. On the right, the posterior view. A number of cancellous fragments could not be reconstituted. This is the hollow point 357 Magnum bullet. The proximal tibia is seen through the transparent gelatin before impact. On impact, the block is transformed into an oval shape. At this point in time, the missile has already passed through the block. The slight projection from the right face of the block is the missile's exit site. Notice how at the point of impact, the left face of the block is raised into a diaphragm-like configuration. The orifice there is approximately two inches in diameter. Also note the bone is positioned in the block beyond the point of maximal temporary cavity formation. A view of the block after this test shot indicates considerable disruption of gelatin anterior to the bone. This is because of fragmentation of the hollow point bullet. In the specimen x-ray, the disrupted lead fragments of the bullet lie before the tibia. In other words, approximately two-thirds of the bullet only passed through the tibia. Some small metallic densities to the right of the bone are lead fragments shed during subsequent passage. The fracture pattern is evident in the anterior-posterior view. These are three views of the reconstituted bone. Eleven fragments were repositioned. 
Metallic fragments from the nose of the bullet that did not transgress the tibia are placed on a small piece of white paper. A 54 caliber Sharps carbine bullet approaches the face of the gelatin block containing a proximal femur. The temporary cavity has an elongated tubular configuration with an accentuation behind the bone because of damage from bone fragments. Notice how the solid lead bullet rotated in the target. It exits almost 90 degrees from its original position at impact. Direct light photography of the block after the test shot indicates considerable disruption behind the femur because of secondary bone splinters. This is confirmed in the specimen x-ray where bone fragments can be seen to the right of the femur. Note the few lead fragments removed from the surface of the solid lead bullet. 20 bone fragments were reconstituted. A considerable number could not be repositioned because of their smaller size. A 58 caliber Springfield mini ball approaches the target from the left. The mounting temporary cavity has an elongated tubular configuration. The distal femur is in the direct path of the missile. Subsequent frames indicate the temporary cavity building to its maximal proportions. In both views, the missile has already passed through the right face of the block. Again, after the test shot, there is little testimony to the violence of impact. There is disruption of the block posteriorly because of the secondary missiles. In the specimen x-ray, it is clear that at least three major blade-shaped fragments from the posterior femur came out in parallel with the general direction of the missile. Some lead debris is located along the distal end of the track. Also, notice the solitary bone splinter to the left of the test femur. The splinter was carried forward toward the shooter. Substantial fracturing is depicted in an anterior-posterior view. 23 fragments were reconstituted. The rather large size of the defect correlates with the size of the missile. There is a large intercondylar fracture. The 5.56 millimeter M16 bullet is a mere 55 grains, but travels more than twice as fast as any other missile in this test series. Here is the test target system just prior to impact. Impact converts the square block into a watermelon shape. There is an extraordinary amount of water vapor inside, masking details of what's happening to the bone. It is suspected that some of the darker shadows represent fragments of the femur displaced around the wall of the cavity. Approximately 30% of the missile escaped the block. This is marked toward the extreme right by a trail of gelatin. The other two-thirds of the bullet remained inside the block in the form of lead dust. In this direct light photograph, there is considerable disruption of gelatin around the bone, and entrapped air masks the general outline of the bone. The radiograph of the block indicates very few pieces of the distal femur remain above a size of two to three centimeters. Abundant metallic fragments of the disrupted missile beyond the bone are mixed with some of the bone fragments. Bone marrow was ejected on the ceiling above the test target. 33 fragments were reconstituted, and abundance of chips and small bone spicules could not be repositioned. One condyle was disrupted into pieces too small to be reconstituted. There are three conclusions from this study. Missiles passing through tissue simulant targets formed temporary cavities from all weapons tested, including handguns and rifles, both antique and modern. The second conclusion, the temporary cavity's maximum size is considerably more dependent on missile velocity than on mass. The bullets are arranged in the sequence tested. On the extreme right is the smallest but fastest missile which did the most damage. The third conclusion is perhaps most important to the surgeon. It is misleading to assess the physical disturbance from a missile's penetration by the appearance of the permanent track. 
A 5 16th inch steel sphere traveling at 1,500 feet per second appears to create a narrow permanent track through a gelatin block. The permanent track is seen with radiating fissures. This does not hint at the marked momentary distortion recorded in these successive frames from the high-speed ballistics motion picture study.